economic recovery program launch happened this week leading to today. At the center of these discussions were the mines. Various economists, other think tanks, were talking about the mines being the solution to what Zambia might be facing in regards to uh, the financial situation. But stay tuned to see what other think tanks are talking about this. The economic uh, situation in Zambia in terms of money has brought in the IMF in the country. We know they're already in the country. But what about the bailout package? The talk just got real. And we also get to the latest news in terms of gold transactions in our country. We get the details and the lowdown on that one. It's time to be jolly. It's time to be merry. It's time for Christmas and leading into the new year. What can you do as a person who's baking cakes to make sure that the time to be jolly and merry extends to you as an entrepreneur to maximize on those finances? These and more items on Strictly Business. <laughs> This is Strictly Business. My name is Judy Ngulube. Now, in this past week, we had the Republican president of Zambia, Edgar Chagwalungu, as well as Minister of Finance, Dr. Walyangandu. We also did get various captains of industry and related fiscal stakeholders concerned about Zambia's financial and economic status in one room at the Mulungushi International Conference Center. What was being discussed? The Economic Recovery Program. Here are the details of how this played out. Most economies globally, including Zambia's, have been left struggling prominently by the effects of COVID-19, among other causes. In responding to the shock, the government has instituted various economic measures, including supporting businesses to stay afloat by making available financial facilities. To put the country firmly on its economic rails, President Edgar Lungu has launched the 2020 to 2023 Economic Recovery Program, which is a result of extensive consultation with the industry players and cooperating partners. The document seeks to rely on economic diversification in agriculture, manufacturing, and tourism. The program I'm launching today provides a clear roadmap of strategic policy actions and enablers required to revive the economy and place it on a path of sustainable growth and development in the medium term. It has five strategic objectives. One, restoring macroeconomic stability. Two, attaining fiscal and debt sustainability. Three, dismantling the backlog of domestic areas. Four, restoring growth and diversifying the economy, and five, safeguarding social protection programs. But the key message regards the status of government in the mining industry in which President Lungu says there is need for significant involvement. We must build on the potential of gold to systematically build our strategic reserves. We must assume a significant stake in some selected mine assets so that we create sufficient value for the nation and also a means of comparing such mines with private sector owned mines. We shall no longer threat mining investors who seek to plow from our God given natural resources, leaving us with empty hands. We shall no longer threat mining investors who cry foul each time we try to earn something from our mines through new tax measures. United Nations UN Resident Coordinator Kumba Magadio said the UN remains committed to supporting Zambia's economic recovery plan. We are cognizant of the government's efforts towards ensuring that fiscal and debt sustainability are restored as only with this can Zambia better protect and deliver on social protection spending and the SDGs. The formulation of the program was coordinated by the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of National Development Planning in consultation with various stakeholders. The ERP is a national short and medium term development tool. I'm hopeful that the private sector, including our farmers and manufacturing companies, will come on board in its implementation. The launch of the ERP comes at an opportune time as it coincides 
with the ongoing formulation of our Eighth National Development Plan, which will run from 2022 to 2026. Sharon Kunda, ZNBC News, Lusaka. In our corporate news, issues of gold transactions in our country, but not forgetting also the IMF is in the country, but Bank of Zambia and ZCCM IH gold transactions. Issues of a bailout and the IMF. We saw this week how pictures of the IMF representatives are interacting with State House as well as other stakeholders regards to our finances. Is this a good sign? Or is it not? And uh, on TV One's Midweek Good Morning Zambia, which is a quite a good morning Zambia, we had a phone call interview with the Economics Association of Zambia president, um, Dr. Lubinda Hawazoka. And also on the same show, we spoke to Charles Mujipi, who is Zambia Gold Company Limited project manager on these two items. This is what they had to say. ZCCMIH, you know, selling gold to uh, the central bank. Um, to what extent uh, would you say this uh, can help uh, revamp uh, Zambia's economic fortunes? Those are the homegrown solutions that we are looking for and looking at as ESA. Mm. I think um, ZCCM should now and uh, than ever before be more aggressive to go and purchase that gold wherever it might be in the Republic, whether it's Zambian uh, origin or foreign origin. Uh, we need to see the first gold bullion in uh, the vaults of the central bank. And that is, uh, you know, when you add uh, gold to your foreign exchange reserve, uh, you know, it's uh, even far much better because if forex would be stagnant in terms of value, Good has been known to uh, to gain value uh, with the years. That is creation of new value. If uh, we upheld the purchase of gold and the stockpiling of gold, I think we shall be able to come out clean uh, uh, during this uh, uh, you know uh, pandemic. So this is not a time for you know sitting in aircon uh, offices. The CMI should be very aggressive. Uh, on the ground, uh, there's a lot of illegal gold mining happening in Kassin City there. Mm. Where is that gold going to? Because that alluvial gold is supposed to be headed straight to the central bank. So these are the issues that we need to look at. And uh, Brian, the, 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 the other things that uh, you see about gold is that other than just being uh, you know, a symbol of wealth for the country, uh, you can use uh, uh, gold uh, as a risk mitigant. Here is the thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, when there's a slowdown in the economy, for example, because of coronavirus, you see that most of the uh, uh, economies in the, in the world are slowing down or have, they've really slowed down. Now, what happens is that the price of gold goes in the opposite direction. Hmm. So it actually gains in value. So uh, when a country has gold reserves, even in bad times, uh, a country stands to benefit because... At an appropriate time, a country can now offload some of those uh, gold reserves, mm -hmm. exchange into into hard uh, currency, stabilize the, uh, the, the the home currency, and even use those resources to develop the country. So uh, it's it's a good thing that we have uh, this valuable resource uh, in our hand. We just have to harness it and uh, you know move forward as a country. We did get various reactions right after the launch of the economic recovery program. Different think tanks did give their, you know, opinions on how and what this meant after all the discussions were done at the Mulungoshi International Conference Center. Our very own TV One did carry out a program tailored to understand the reactions and what implications what was said can be. And we did actually engage John Lijimu, Yusuf Dodia, and Mutisunge Zulu on this one. What struck me is the fact that I think the president is very conscious of the fact that there has to be job creation in this country. Uh, he recognizes the fact that youth unemployment is quite um, high and there is need for us to put in strategies that should be able to 
create a conducive environment within which youths should be employed, right. should get employment. I think that was good. And if all the issues that we have to work with this ERP has to target the fact that there is going to be uh, a fertile ground for which people can access employment and be able to be productive. I think it was a polite way of saying they need to pull up their socks. We're tired of, um, you know, marginal uh, profitability and performance. They need to start operating the same way as competitive as the private sector um, operates. We can't have SOEs being a drain on government resources because every penny does count at mm. this point. The second thing that really stands out for me is the president talks about um, uh, debt sustainability. He talks about uh, domestic debt as well because I think most times we speak about debt, we focus so much on the external debt and we think because it's domestic, uh, maybe the central bank would run a QE exercise and print money and meet that target. No, it has to be managed as well. So, And that I would like to marry it with what we saw a few weeks ago. There's that picture where they, they, uh, there was a central bank governor this side, the secu uh, secretary to the treasury, and you had those IMF uh, officials coming in and it's very clear that there is buy-in. If you can have the IMF even go to state house and they can confer with the president is clearly there is buy-in, but a debt redemption strategy uh, needs to be yeah. very, very clear in the document. I know that there has been an advisor that has been hired, that Lazard Freres, but I think um, debt is the biggest elephant in yeah. the room. So right. much as, yes, we've got the private sector yeah. this side, but then we're saying whatever resources need to come, need to, you know, are being gobbled by debt. Right. So it, the gun that shoots the elephant is our mineral resources. I think if you listen to the presentation, the big message was we have got opportunities in mining. We need to harness those opportunities in a meaningful way for our, our economy. And those opportunities in mining are the ones that are going to shoot that debt right. to get rid of it. And it will also benefit the people of the country. And I think that was the big message. He, he talked about us being exploited, uh, being, you know, uh, that it was not a win-win situation, and that those who are not willing to work with us, this is the time to, to think about uh, whether you want to be here or not. <laughs> and to me, that is the clarion call for Zambia. Right. You know? So um, uh, to me, I think that's a big message. But I think it must not end here. Yeah. We yes. talked about it. Yeah. We know where it is. We all can see it. Now we just need to see how we can put this into motion. And the value of 2021 is that it's, it's do or die. Right. Yeah. If we don't produce results, uh, 2021 can turn out to be quite a disastrous year. <laughs>coming to the close of the year 2020 strictly business did start uh, you know slightly towards the end of this year and we've featured various artists and artistic creative minds on this segment of biztainment now we are going to give tips things that they have said before things that they have emphasized on but when you bunch it up for somebody who hasn't seen this we'll give you tips of how to market your creativity, how to make sure that your creation or your art pieces, your artworks, your art creations are marketed well out there. Now, these are the following according to a research done by the com. Get a website, increase your email list, focus on social media, try paid digital advertisements. Think ahead for the best marketing strategy now these five are something that will get you ahead and i mean information age everyone is saying once you get onto a platform and you use it to the fullest maximizing on it you will definitely get something from it let's get to our tech and innovation segment Those two words, technology and innovation, are the words of the 21st century. People say it's a communication age, but what are we talking about when it comes to that exactly? On Take and Innovation segment today, we're going to focus on issues of app creation. And this is because Nova and Supernova have been created. Now, this is an app that has been created by Daylight Technologies. I'm glad to have the Chief Executive Officer today to talk to. His name is Charles Kateleshi. How are you? I'm good, thank you, Judy. How thank you, you so much for coming, Drew. Thank you for having me. So tell us about Nova and Supernova. Okay, so Nova is a music streaming platform. 
it allows artists to distribute their music. And we give all of the control to the artists, everything from uploading to data statistics, and, and the platform is also 100% encrypted. So anybody who buys a song cannot share it with someone else. Oh, great. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. I mean, um, the art industry in Zambia is receiving so much right now in terms of support. Mm -hmm. uh, financials have been given to them. Finances have been given to them. Yeah. But when you talk about these two apps and what they can do, yeah. to what extent can they contribute to, you know, of uh, moving the art industry from this level to, to the, the next, next level? level. I, I I'd say global distribution. Um, that's very key. Um, a lot of the international platforms are difficult to get on. Um, different regulations and, and things like that. Nova gives you all of the control so you can upload at your own time and anybody in the world can buy your music or download your free music. We hear the yeah. app, the person who created the app makes more money. Tell me when it comes to <laughs> revenue, <laughs> revenue creation, income <laughs> generation for this, for, from your end mm -hmm. and also the user's end. Okay, so um, our platform, the, our business model is different. And we, because we're artists ourselves, we want artists to make more money. So our business model is revenue share. So we only make money when you make money. And it's 75%, 25%. So 75% goes to the artist, we only take 25%. Mm, okay. When you look at the policies that are currently paterning, mm -hmm. that are, are, are in our country, yeah. would you say it's a platform that is supportive and reacting positively mm -hmm. to issues such as app creation? I, I think the policies are flexible, in my opinion. Uh, most of my research on, you know, from other countries, because obviously Nova being a, an international platform, I have to look at the laws in different countries and things like that. The Zambian laws with regards to cyberspace is quite flexible, flexible enough to allow you to innovate. Another thing I, I hear often is the issues of, well, because, you know, our network and some of our solutions that go like key, <laughs> are they still like that? How easy is it then to bring in an app that you're supposed to operate on a global scale? Yes, um, there's, according to Zikta, about 6 million internet users in Zambia. Um, generally, the, the internet penetration is, has been rising over the years, so that's, that's good news for companies like Daylight Technologies. Um, we've tried in our app development to limit or reduce the data consumption so that even a person from like Chawama mm -hmm. can have access to high high grade content. Mm. Yeah. And now that you bring in, you know, uh, accessibility to yeah. each and every person, I'm thinking of the um, accessibility levels in our country. Yeah. Our we have the urban, we have the rural, yeah. but it doesn't mean that the rural area doesn't have artists, it doesn't have people who are creating music True. who want a, a bigger platform. How then do you accommodate those so that they also, you know, yeah. get an income and generate something and, you know, increase their, their, their base in terms of um, eyeballs and ears? Yeah, that's a yeah. good question. That's a good question. So um, we thought about that on the platform. It was, um, it was a balance, right? On one side, we don't want to be a platform where just anybody can just come and upload. On the other hand, we want to provide enough opportunity for upcoming artists to distribute their music. So in order to strike that balance, we've created free accounts on both platforms. So an artist can join, sign up, and start distributing right away. Mm -hmm. Of course, we limit the space just so that, you know, it, it doesn't become the next, like, SoundCloud ah, or something like great, that. Great, great. Yeah. In winding up, mm -hmm. uh, your, your message or what pops up in your head whenever you think uh, innovation technology in our country at this time with everything surrounding us? Yes, uh, I would say... Of course, necessity is the mother of all innovation, but I think you wouldn't have innovation without skill. Mm -hmm. So my advice to all young people everywhere would be acquire the skill set. If you don't know an industry well enough, you cannot innovate on it, you can't improve on it until you have the, the proper skill, until you become an expert in that field. So whatever you do, learn the skills. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming through. Thank you for having me. I appreciate. Ciao, Kataleji. They are the Chief Executive Officer for Daylight Technologies. This is Strictly Business.
This is Strictly Business. We get into a story that will inspire us this Christmas. A lady who was doing something completely different but related to, uh, you know, a build-up of the business she was in. Making curtains, using decorations to make merry and jolly, not only for weddings and parties. And then she realized, wait a minute, I can make this complete if I start making cake. Our next guest, Juliana Mandere, is the director of Baker's Haven. She went into the cake making business by accident, but look how she has made merry from it. I just didn't start with baking. I used to do the home industry as a whole. I used to make curtains, I used to do wedding deco, and I used to do cakes as well. But I realized that um, since I was handling a lot of stuff, I also needed people to help me. And people can be such a big disappointment. Mm -hmm. So with cakes, I realized I could do everything on my own. So I told myself that, okay, let me specialize in cakes. I invest in training. I invest in um, equipment. It's something I decided to learn. And as I learned it, I did I developed such a passion for it where I would even do cakes for free because I just wanted to try out a certain cake that maybe I saw on YouTube or in a book. I would do cakes for people for free. But then people realized that my cakes were good. Not only did they taste good, but they looked good. And I decided to make it into a big business. That wasn't an easy journey, I should say. To start with, I didn't have capital. Nobody gave me capital. I started with the little money that I generated from the one or two cakes that I made. And I realized it was not going to be easy. But I had amassed a lot of um, knowledge in terms of baking. So I decided to raise capital by teaching one or two people. And my first students were in 2004. I had two students and I needed to raise money to do Christmas cakes. And as I was teaching those ladies, I realized that I actually had a passion to share my knowledge and the market was too big for me. I mean, there was space for all of us. So I taught those ladies, I raised my capital, I made my Christmas cakes. Um, the money started coming in, people started knowing me. Um, I would get orders from companies and I had a number of women, uh, influential women, who really helped me in my journey. Because when I was making curtains, I used to make curtains for people like Mukwandi, Chibesakunda. I made curtains for Mukwandi, I made curtains for Ms. Ingamelu, I made curtains for Mrs. Mtalima, Irene Mtalima, that time she was um, head of some loan company in Osaka. So those are the same women who now ended up supporting my cake business as well. For me, um, competition hasn't been a problem for me because had competition been a problem for me, I would not even have been teaching. And even as I started teaching, such questions started arising. Jules, you're creating competition for yourself. Why are you teaching? And I would say the market is too big, you know, and I'm not teaching mainly because of the money. In the end, I was not teaching for the money. I was teaching because it was a passion and I felt there were a number of women out there who, like me, needed to make extra income for themselves. So I never saw them as competition. I always made sure that my product was unique in its own way. And I had my own niche of customers who followed my particular product. And I also realized in my students that this one was gifted in this, this one is gifted in this, and I would encourage them to pursue that because you know that with the cake with the baking uh, industry it's you can specialize you can have someone specializing in wedding cakes you can have someone specializing in birthday cakes you can have someone specializing in desserts you can have someone specializing in just basic pastries so I would recognize that in my students and I would encourage them to say you are good in this can you follow this can you follow this and personally I specialized in wedding cakes okay for me um, Okay, there are more highs than lows, I should say. But let me start with the lows. The lows, um, it's not an easy industry. You know, dealing with people is not easy. And handling food for people is not easy. 
So you get clients who think they know about cakes, but they don't know. <laughs> All right, and that has been our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us on Strictly Business. And as you make that money, as you make those investments, remember the reason for the season. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.